Welcome. Fine day for a walk in the cemetery. It was a lot like this when I, on the day when I arrived. My name's Lloyd Gilligan. That day was 140 years ago. I see things move a lot faster now than they did back then. I don't imagine it takes more than an hour to get here from Hydesville. Hydesville's a long way yet from Hinchinbrook, where I come from, up by Quebec. Now, I didn't know much when I set out, but I'm a fast learner. For instance, it only took me eight days to figure out the militia wasn't for me. I took my first pay from them, and I lit out for the land of plenty, Canada's neighbor to the south. It's a fascinating place, these United States. Back then, a lot of it was still, shall we say, open to interpretation. The fellow was willing to try anything. He never lacked for entertainment or employment. As I moved west, I passed through the prairie, and there I settled on a hay farm for a time. And in those bunkhouses at night, I met some gentlemen who played cards. Now, that seemed to offer a lot of possibilities to me, so I watched them closely. Now, many times, they moved on with my pay in their pockets, but I kept practicing, and before long, the lining of my pockets was restored to overflowing. I didn't stick around and wait for anybody to get sore. I continued on west. I'd heard about what was going on here in California, how half the world's population was trying to dig the territory off the face of the earth, looking for mountains of gold under the soil and, and uh, creeping through the rocks and laying out in the rivers like windfall apples. Now, that had been going on long enough that I figured I could do my digging with a deck of cards in the company of men who'd already done the hard part. Now, a man of my business practices doesn't want to wear out his welcome. One town led to another and to another, and before long I was in Eureka. And there I made the acquaintance of, of capitalists and financiers, men like Mr. Hike and Mr. McClellan. And Mr. Hike helped me to acquire a sawmill back over there in Hydesville. And uh, that seemed to be going pretty well, but you know, the, the sound of the riffling of the cards and the rattle of the chips never left my ears. It was kind of like the siren song luring the ship of my estate onto the rocks. When the time came, Mr. Hike was good enough to take the sawmill and lure the payment I owed him on my debt. But I didn't let one setback stop me. I continued on to acquire other properties, uh, among them the Star Hotel here on Main Street in your town of Fortuna. Now, Mr. McClellan and I made a deal with a Mr. McKenna and we purchased it when it was at the height of its prosperity. Sad to say, my education didn't include hotel management, and before long that too passed from my estate. But Mr. McClellan saw in me a resource he wanted to develop, and he sent me to Colorado to learn uh, the cattle trade. And I traveled all over developing business contacts, and uh, after a time, my travels led me to New Mexico. And it's there that I must leave you with some mystery. Now, I'd had a particularly good time at the tables one night when a precipitous young fellow, unschooled in the ways of controlling his temper, took exception to what he considered to be improper manipulation of the cards in my hand. He drew a knife and struck out at me. I'd never felt such a sting. Now, I imagine the quantity of blood alarmed everyone present, but one gentleman saw fit to uh, secure medical care for me, and now, having cleared the table before the assault, I was left with my profits, and, well, maybe that was a fatal blow. The newspaper said it was. Maybe that, uh, that uh, Lloyd Gilligan that showed up tending bar at a saloon in uh, Colorado a couple of years later was just a coincidence. Seems he wasn't any better a businessman than I was, though. And the following year, he was listed as a laborer on a hay farm. Now, one thing we know for sure, I'm dead. And if I owe you money, well, you're a little late in asking. Now, I'm not buried here myself, but before you leave today, you're going to meet some people who are. Let me tell you a thing or two about them. First, there's John Phipps, who met his untimely fate thanks to a steam train. There's J.H. Thompson and his daughter, Belle good, decent people with an ancestor whose name you may recognize. Miss Emma Olive Harris O'Connor, who I remember as Humboldt County's finest photographer south of Eureka. Miss Marie Morin, 
who took her own life in the depths of what I believe is known as the Great Depression. Nels Tonneson, a young man from Norway who wanted to fight for his new country but who ended up fighting a losing battle with tuberculosis. There's Robert Huber, who still hopes to solve the mysterious death of a friend in the woods near Scotia in 1909. And Mrs. Margie Durnford Flora, who abruptly left this mortal sphere one bright summer's day in 1922. Howdy, my name's John Phipps, John Nathan Phipps, to set me apart from all the other John Phipps out in the universe, past, present, and future. I've been occupying a plot down the hill little ways for the last 95 years or so. It was the front end of a steam train that put me down there back in the days when I actually had trains in Humboldt County. I was born in Ukiah, 1863. My pa, also John, was a farmer. He had a ranch just outside the Ukiah city limits. He raised lettuce and kale and stuff like that you pull out of the ground. But what I remember most were the sheep. They were the only livestock he raised, and I found them a whole lot more fun to play with than uh, pulling heads of cabbage out of the dirt. Now, uh, when I was about six or seven, I got to take care of those sheep. In fact, it was a sheep and a bear and that old steam train that put me down there uh, at the then elderly age of 56. I met the bear when I was 10. I remember it was a little after dark on a cool spring evening. It looked like it was going to rain, so naturally I'd left my jacket out on the fence post. Pa sent me out to fetch it before it got wet. I did so, and as I did, I saw that a sheep had gotten out. So I went over to get it and put it back inside the fence, and I was mistaken. It was not a sheep. At the time, I didn't know what it was. It was dark. I got so scared. Later on, they told me it was a little bear cub. That would explain what the other thing was, the bigger thing, that cussed thing that comes tearing out of the dark and tore my shred, my ear to shreds. I would have been a mother bear, as protective as any mother might be, when a stranger came up to its cub in the dark. Well, it comes tearing out after me, tore a chunk out of my finger. It would have done a lot more had Pana come running out then with his rifle here in the commotion. A couple of shots aimed high in the trees, scared the bear and the cub away in the woods. Uh, I come out of it okay. I had a nasty scar on my finger. They patched up my ear, but it never worked right since. I'm still kind of half deaf here. So Pa scared the bear away that night, but it stayed in my mind and it would not leave. Uh, for years I'd wake up screaming, terrified about that thing that attacked me, convinced that that bear, or something worse, had unfinished business with me. So Pa moved me and Ma and my sister Mary Ellen down to San Luis Obispo about 1880, thinking maybe a change of place might do me some good. It did not, but uh, I did marry a fine neighbor girl named Ida Marsh in 1884, but she could not abide my constant paranoia and the fact it kept me from holding down a decent job, so she divorced me in the early 1890s. I married again in 1903 to a widow named uh, Rebecca Morris, Bessie to me, she gave me a son, three daughters, and a dozen years of companionship until my constant panic about something coming out of those woods to get me uh, drove her away from me as well. After she divorced me, I found out that she had uh, checked herself into the county hospital for some kind of emotional distress and that my four children, then in their early teens, had been boarded or were being boarded at the uh, county juvenile detention home in the same town. That pained me quite a bit. Well, I moved up to Humboldt in the early 19-teens. My sister, uh, Mary Ellen, was living up here in Harris, so I stayed with her for a little while. And she found out that uh, my son Ernest and daughter Pearl were actually doing well then, living in a place in Paso Robles. That made me mighty glad. But then, that last day, I met the bear at Eel Rock, our moment of reckoning. It was uh, just after dusk, February 27, 1920. I was, uh, I'd caught some fish and fried some fish up out of the Eel River. And I was walking up the bluff toward the train tracks when all of a sudden I saw something coming out of those woods right towards me. I couldn't tell what it was in the dark. I couldn't hear a darn thing, but I knew what it was and I ran. 
I looked back and I, I caught a glimpse of a splay of billowing black hair erupting from its head, wild in the wind, a single eye bearing down on me as it reached a claw to scoop me up. I put all the energy I could in my legs to try to run, and I couldn't outrun it. It was right behind me. I looked back again. Uh, I looked up into its riveted face. Rivets. I saw rivets bolting the edge of an iron boiler plate, a oil lamp beaming down on me, a shovel-like cowcatcher about to thrust itself underneath me. I realized the steam train. That's what it was. It was a Northwestern Pacific steam train carrying a load of timber down the coast of San Francisco. That's all it was. I cursed my superstitious folly, and then it obliterated me, and all my thoughts dissolved into a charcoal mist. And that's why I went up down there. It was a quiet place, friendly neighbors. The woods are a little close for comfort, but I do believe I've made peace with bear and train alike. I think of my children, and I hope by now they've had children, and they are happy and clear-headed. Just a cussed steam train. Leastwise, well, that's all I think it was. Good day. Hello, folks. Welcome to the Thompson and Brown family part of the cemetery. You picked such a lovely day to come visit with us. I used to enjoy so much being outside on the warm sunny days of Indian summer when we lived in Ferndale and then later on here in Fortuna. Oh, did any of you happen to have attended the Ferndale Fair this year? Did they have a big doll exhibit? How about the pavilions with the butter and dairy machinery? I used to sneak into the horse races too, but mother and father did not approve of that. Do they still have horse races at the fair? The fair. I was so looking forward to it that September of 1900. Father had read to me from the paper about that big doll exhibit, and I so wanted to see it. But then I had to die of tonsillitis. Tell him about it, Father. Father, wake up. We have guests. <laughs> oh. Tell them about how I died. Tell them all of the comforting things you said to me while I was dying of tonsillitis. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Henry Thompson. Thank you for visiting with us. If she has forgotten her manners, may I introduce my daughter, Mary Isabel. How do you do? Uh, what were you saying, Belle? I was just telling these nice folks about how I was looking forward to the fair, but then I had to die of tonsillitis uh, before I could go. Yes, but, but it wasn't tonsillitis like the doctors thought while you were sick. No, it was diphtheria, the strangling angel that took you and your sister Martha from us. Oh, what a bitter cup of affliction we drank from then. All your mother and I could do was watch helplessly for days as you struggled to breathe. I don't remember much about that. Oh, that's a blessing. How I wish we'd had vaccines back in my day. Why well, I would have given my right hand for such medicine if it would have prevented the death and suffering of my daughters. But I do remember all of the comforting words that you said to me while I was on my deathbed. Hmm. Words that came to me from my parents and grandparents. If they help you, I'm glad. I remember my family talking a lot about sacrifice and dying around the time my grandfather, John Brown, led his raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry with the hope that he could free the slaves in Virginia. Yes, that's what I wanted you to tell them about. How when I was sick, you told me stories of your grandfather and how brave he was when he knew he had to die, so I wouldn't be afraid. Tell me again about that letter he wrote to you from prison. Well, that letter wasn't just to me, Belle. It was to his wife and daughters, including my mother, Ruth Brown. He wrote, when and in what form death may come is but of small moment. I feel content to die on a scaffold for God's eternal truth and for suffering humanity. I want you to be of good cheer. This life is intended as a season of training, chastisement, temptation, affliction, and trial. But the righteous shall come out of it all. Trust in the Lord and do good. And then they hanged him. Well, yes, the United States government did execute him. He was tried and convicted of treason. But I believe it was all part of his mission as an abolitionist. His greatest purpose in life was to bring about the end of slavery in America. He wrote other letters to his friends from prison. They were published in newspapers and helped rally support for the abolitionist cause. And in the end, your grandfather's raid on Harper's Ferry and his execution are considered by many to be the opening act of the Civil War. So he was a hero? Well, that's the way he always seemed to me. As a little boy, it was so hard for me to accept that he wasn't coming home again. Mother's last letter to grandfather in prison included some words I said that well, I don't even remember saying them. I was so young at the time. 
Johnny says, tell grandfather that I hope he lives to come back here again. Well, that didn't happen. And after his execution, the Brown and Thompson families were left to carry on as best we could. So, then you came to California. That's right. Grandmother Brown settled in Ronerville, and when your mother and I married, we came out west to live with her. We wanted her to be the one to deliver our babies, as she delivered so many other infants in Ronerville. My grandfather died to free the slaves, and my grandmother lived to help those around her. I suppose both of those are heroism. Try to do everything in the very best way possible. My mother used to say that to me, as her father said it to her. And that means both living well and dying well. Father, it wasn't that I was afraid of dying, really. I was afraid of never seeing you and mother and everyone else again. But I didn't need to be afraid of that, did I? No, Belle, you didn't need to be afraid of that, because here we are, together. And do you remember the other thing your great-grandfather said to his family way back when his young daughter Amelia died? Let us try to maintain a cheerful self-command while we are tossing up and down, and let our motto still be action, action, as we have but one life to live. Thanks for visiting with us today. We hope you have a pleasant afternoon. Don't forget to visit the fair next year. Ugh, oh, the smell. That's the part that I will never forget. The smell and the burning as it went down. Oh, but where are my manners? My name is Frida Marie Gibbs Morin. Most call me Marie. One hears about these things, you know. Poor, despondent souls taking their own lives. I knew of this woman, Lottie Farmer was her name. On May 20th, 1932, she drank Lysol not too far from here at the county library. You never think you could reach that level point in your own life until one day you find yourself sitting in the drawing room reading the newspaper and it asks you, what are you going to do about it? Well, what can you do about it really? What is there in your own control to do? You see, it was the depths of the Great Depression, September 30th, 1932. On that page of the paper, there was a cartoon, a woman dressed in robes labeled public relief, and next to her a trunk with its lid open labeled 25 million jobless and dependents. 25 million? That number is inconceivable. What can you do with a number like that stacked against you? My John knew what to do, or at least he thought he did anyway. He was away in San Francisco when I drank the stuff. I couldn't bear for him to find me. He was off trying to get our finances back to where they used to be. Many of us thought San Francisco was where we could regain our wealth. He was such a hard worker, staying with his sister while he was gone, because we had so little to spare. We grew up together, you know. High school sweethearts we were. He was such a dear. He proposed to me in our favorite spot down by the creek. We were married in the fall of 1926, and the leaves were so beautiful that year, vibrant and colorful. He worked as a civil engineer for the governor, C.C. Young. Very important work. We were one of the wealthiest families on our street in Oakland once. Our house was worth $5,000, and we had a radio, before it all went wrong. I had a wonderful family. My father, James Gibbs, my mother, Mary Elland, and my younger brother, James. My parents were married in 1896, and I was born 10 years later. My father worked as a woodsman once, but he was a farmer for most of my life. My parents were both born in North Carolina. They used to tell us fantastical stories about their trip from North Carolina to Northern California. My brother and I grew up listening to these stories, and at some point we must have known that they were mostly made up, but we loved them anyway. We used to ask my mother and father to tell us the story of their trip around Christmas time when we were all gathered around the fire after a wonderful supper. My mother had a tough life. She gave birth to five children, but only my brother and I survived to adulthood. Sometimes, I think about how much it must have hurt her, knowing what I had done. 
Or perhaps she thought that I was strong for taking my life into my own hands instead of always following what someone else had planned for me. The Lysol was not hard to find. Perhaps that was why it was so popular, even though it was so horrid. I could feel it burning all the way down. My, my stomach ached from it. You know that poet, uh, Charlotte Mew? She died a few years before I did from drinking Lysol. Uh, May of 1928, I believe. She would probably have some dramatic and pretty words to describe the feeling, but it's really the smell that gets to you. Potent and powerful it was. I can remember being taken somewhere before I died. There was so much white. White sheets, I think. Perhaps it was the hospital in Scotia. I left a note for my husband. I wish I could remember what I told him. I can only hope I was reassuring him that he would be fine without me. I probably asked him to look after James for me. My brother was always getting into trouble. I hope he settled down and found a nice woman and had a family. He deserved it. I know my John must have found a lovely woman to make his home a wonderful place to be. Perhaps he was better off without me anyway. Oh, the smell. I wish it would just go away. Oh, hi. I didn't see you arrive. I was just remembering my old motorcycle. I miss the freedom and excitement of riding. Do we have any riders here? No? Well, everybody should ride a motorcycle at least once. Guaranteed it'll change the way you look at the world. I should probably start at the beginning. I am Nels Tonensen. I was born of June 19th, 1894 in Mandel, Norway. But I wouldn't say my life really started until I bought my ticket to America. In 1911, when I was only 17 years old, I waited a week in an overcrowded boarding house. I was just one of thousands waiting for passage before I got to board the Arabic in Liverpool. I spent that week working as a runner, hauling luggage for those lucky enough to be leaving early. On November 21st, I arrived in Boston, wide-eyed and ready. I had extended family in the Pacific Northwest, so I was headed to Oregon immediately. I worked my way across this great country thanks to the generosity of its wonderful citizens and I spent a few years perfecting my English and learning all I could about the New World. But you're not really here to hear about my, my life farming, which is what I did for a few more years before I could purchase my freedom. And by freedom, I mean a motorcycle. A brand new 1916 Harley Davidson 16F twin engine. Oh, that bike took me all over the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the best roads and tallest trees I had ever seen. I spent a few months just tooling around, enjoying the sights. Life on the road, it feeds the soul, but it, it empties the wallet. So broke and happy, I went to visit my cousin Tom in Fortuna, where he got me a job with the Eel River Valor Lumber Company as their pond man. For those of you who don't know, a log pond is for the storage and transportation of logs and also a handy firefighting resource. You should also know that this country means everything to me, so it should surprise nobody that I registered for the war. I call it the war, but really, my understanding is, is you refer to it as World War I which means you've had more world wars. Anyway, I was 23 and still a bachelor, and the way the war was going, I knew I'd be drafted soon. A fine gal from the home country by the name of Johanna Wirthaus had captured my attention and allowed me to see her most days after work. Upon learning that I had registered for the war, she didn't want to see me anymore because she knew I'd be shipped off and might never return. However, a month later, when I asked her to marry me, she said yes, and we were married on July 14th, 1917 at the Eureka Courthouse and not a moment too soon. A week later on the 21st, I found my name in the Humboldt Standard with many others as those lucky enough to be called to colors on September 5th. As an example of the ruthless efficiency of our army, before May of that year, Camp Lewis didn't even exist. Captain David Stone and his crew arrived on, March, on May 26th and began construction immediately. They had only 90 days, but they put up 767 buildings and 422 other structures, had them wired and heated for the over 60,000 men that would be trained there and they did it all 30 days ahead of schedule. 
I was one of the first groups of men to arrive at the camp, and we spent 21 days in quarantine getting our immunization shots, uh, which some of us could easily use. The, the camp got crowded and got more cramped every day. Men were arriving from all over the country in every size and shape. We were trained hard and worked even harder. We were being molded into the fighting force known as the 91st Div uh, uh, American Expeditionary Force. Unfortunately for me, this, this cough had found me and wouldn't leave, so halfway through training, they sent me up to the Vancouver Barracks, a hospital in Washington, where I was diagnosed with tuberculosis. I wasn't alone, though. 14% of all of the medical discharges were due to tuberculosis. And even though I was ready and willing to fight the Hun, my diagnosis kind of came as a blessing in disguise. I had just learned from my wife that we were expecting a child. It seems our last nights together had been quite fruitful. I got an honorable discharge due to ill health and returned home just a few days before my son was born, George Donenson, a great American name. Well, I got to go home, but all the other men had to go overseas. Oh, my, my wife, Johanna, had been staying with her family in Lolita while she was with child, and when I got home, that's where I stayed too. And my health didn't improve at all as I watched my son, George, grow, and the tuberculosis took me away from it all just a few months later. I left behind a strong, beautiful wife and a handsome baby boy. It displeases me to tell you that my son George was to join me here just two and a half years later. It seems that he contracted infantile paralysis and succumbed to it within just a few months. Now you might know this disease as polio. It does please me, however, to tell you that my wife Johanna went on without me, got remarried and had many more children. In fact, she lived until 2002, where she died just a few months before her 102nd birthday. Well, that's my story. And Thank you. I'm going to get back to my motorcycle. Ride safe. Hi there. You're probably all here looking for Isaac Cooper, and to be honest, so am I. I was out with him hunting one night, and something happened that was so baffling to me, no one could explain it. Me, I'm Robert Huber. I was his hunting companion that night. I was born in 1884 in South Dakota, came out to Humboldt County in 1900. But we're not here to talk about me, we're here to talk about Mr. Cooper and his untimely mysterious death. Mr. Cooper was very uh, private about his private life, very little is actually known about him. What is known, however, is that when he moved out here, him and his wife be, were um, lead cooks at the planning camp for Pacific Lumber Company outside of Scotia. He was also an active odd fellow, a Rebecca, and a woodsman of the world, which incidentally he had a $3,000 life policy, which may come into the picture later on. We're not 100% sure at this point. I'll never forget that fateful day. It was August 26th, 1909. We went out on a hunting trip. At one point we decided we were gonna split up. He took the high ground and I took the low ground. As I was out hunting, at one point I heard two shotgun fires ring out. Didn't think much of it, because when you're out in a hunting area, shotgun is not the most uncommon sound you hear while you're out. We did have a code in place that if there was three direct fires that we were calling each other to either come back to camp or if there was an emergency. However, at that point, I'd only heard two. An hour later, I heard a single shot. Once again, I thought nothing of it. About 9 p.m., I finally rolled back into camp, noticed that Mr. Cooper had not arrived yet, and as I was getting ready to fire the three gun warning shot for him to return to camp when I saw something off in the dense distance. I walked out there to see Mr. Cooper lying on the ground in pain. My initial thought was Mr. Cooper had probably tripped, hurt his leg in some manner, and had dragged himself as far as he could trying to get back to camp. However, as I got closer, I realized the situation was far more dire than that. Mr. Cooper was actually bleeding from a shotgun wound to the gut. I took one look at him, and I don't claim to be a doctor, but I could easily tell, even if I could have found help in time, there was nothing anyone could have done for this poor man. I asked him what had happened, and all he could say was that he had slipped. At which point, I decided to help him back to camp, and he wandered around camp, almost in a delirium for a while, erratically waving his gun through the air. I didn't think that was the greatest idea in the world, so I asked him to lie down, and eventually he finally did before losing consciousness. At that point, all I could do was sit and wait. I sat there with him all night, and then his final words started to really get to me. I slipped, what did that mean? I'm not a forensics exp expert either, but 
Looking at the gunshot wound and the fact that we were using hunting shotguns, shooting yourself is not exactly an easy process. The only way it could have really happened is if he would have dropped the gun, it would have tumbled down a hill and fired itself on the way down. But just to check, I took a look at his gun and found it fully loaded with unexploded cartridges on the inside. Now, logic says if you shoot yourself in the belly, you're not going to reload after you do it. So at that point, those words I slipped really started to get to me. What does that mean? Because he obviously, in my eyes, had not shot himself at that point. So all I could do was sit and wait as my mind raced. Well, like I said, he was very secretive about his private life. Was there some kind of second life I didn't know about? Was this some kind of retribution for someone he had wronged and he felt that he had deserved it so he was covering up for them by saying he'd done it to himself? Either way, all I could do was sit there with my thoughts, hoping at one point he would regain consciousness and could answer some of my questions. Unfortunately, at midnight, his soul left his body and took the mystery with it. Next morning when sun rose, all I could do was walk out to Scotia to try to find someone to gather the body up and bring it back home. I found a nice man on the side of the road who actually went into the woods with his horse and brought the body out to the main road where a car was waiting to transport it back to Fortuna. The forensics examination proved exactly what I had already figured out. They said that the bullet had entered in right at the gut and gone in a straight line through and exited near the spine, tearing the intestines on the way out, such as is seen with a bullet fired from a long distance away. I was questioned and then released and exonerated of any kind of charge. However, at that point it was ruled a minor hu hunting accident and the case was closed. But to this day, those final words still haunt me. I slipped. What did they really mean? What was it? What was he hiding? I reckon you guys all have other people you'd like to talk to at this point. I'm just going to stay around here hoping he may show up at some point. It was July 1st, 1922. It was an ordinary event. It's happened to all of us before. The wind blows at a certain direction, takes off your hat, you reach down, you pick it up. This time it wasn't ordinary. It was life changing, or life ending, I should say. My name is Margaret Dernford Flora. My family and friends call me Margie, Flora, like the flowers in my mother's garden in Blocksburg. Back then, Blocksburg was an important stagecoach hub between Eureka and Bridgeville. My story didn't start there, though. It started at a hotel in Covalo where my mother Clara worked. My father, he was a stagecoach driver from Cloverdale to Covalo. And I expect after one of his long rides, all he wanted to do was rest his weary eyes, but instead rested them on my mother. They fell in love, and so much so that they had seven children, and I was the third oldest, with my big sister, Leona, ahead of me. We used to dote on our little brother, James, so much so that we recalled his little mothers. My mother, she was always cooking and canning and sewing and cleaning. She'd say, girls, take your brother James out to play. I can't get any work done with him running underneath my feet. It wasn't all work, though. It was 1912, and I was 18, and my father told me about this fiddle player named Lester Leck Flora. Lester's Lex brother, Samuel, had just drowned in the Eel River. He was a stagecoach driver as well, just like my father, and that's how he knew him. He thought that Lex would be cheered up by us watching him play at one of the five saloons, so we, I agreed and we went. The minute he started playing, I was mesmerized. Don't get me wrong, there were many fine gentlemen in Blocksburg but not as talented as Leck. He seemed to feed off my gaze as he played that sweet melody that seemed worlds away from my dusty little town. We were married very quickly and 
five months later, had my son, Gerald. And time seemed to pass rather smoothly until the dreaded year of 1918. Leck was drafted in the war. I admit I was a little nervous. Losing Leck would have been devastating. Gerald was only six years old. It's funny, the things that you worry about that don't come true. Leck never died in World War I. He was a domestic casualty. He, he died of the great pandemic, the flu. It killed three times as many people as World War I. And it didn't end with Leck. My sister Lucille contracted it, and my mother went to take care of her in Oakland. And Lucille got better, but my mother passed away from it. So with Leck gone and my mother gone, I thought it was even more important not to lose touch with my family. So July 1st, 1922, Gerald and I packed the car and we were ready for the long drive to Covalo to visit my father for 4th of July. The sun was up and the top was down and I had a hat on to shield my eyes from the sun and we rounded the corner near Twin Rocks in Covalo when I blew my hat off and I reached down to grab it and my car sailed over the cliff, rolling several times, knocking me unconscious. Gerald climbed up the bank and was able to get help, but it was too late for me. In that instant, my boy became an orphan. He went on eventually to live with my sister Leona, and 60 years later, he lays here with Leck and I. My boy never lost touch with his family after all.